Why don't we give Jesus a big round of applause? How about that? We love you, Lord. We love you, Lord. We love you, God. We love you, Lord, so much. Dear God, thank you so much for your love and for your grace. Thank you for this amazing place. God, thank you for every person, Lord, that made it here today by your grace. Thank you, God, because I know that you didn't, you didn't just bring us to a church. You brought us to your presence. We ask you right now, King of kings and Lord of lords, that you would change our hearts, that you would speak into our lives. Lord, that everyone that walked in through these doors would not walk out the same way. It is your word, it is your truth that changes people, not a church. And we pray, God, right now that your powerful, mighty word would have its beautiful effect in our lives. Thank you so much for everything you've done. God, if you do nothing else, you've already done so much. But I know that today, God, you will do wonders. Right now, God, we declare that it is all about you. We cancel distractions. We cancel anything, God, that's trying to take away from your love, from your message into our hearts. It is in your name that we pray. Amen and amen. Give God one more round of applause. Tell the person next to you, you look really good. You look amazing. And welcome home. Awesome, awesome stuff. What an amazing, amazing day. Today we have Fill the House. Uh, if you are here for the first time, you know, we're not going to ask you to stand up or anything like that. But I do want to welcome you. I want to tell you this is, is a, it's a place that you can call home. It really, really is. It's, a, it's an amazing place. There's amazing people. We love God with all of our hearts. We're not perfect, but we have room for one more imperfect person. So, uh, <laughs> but we do, we do love God with all of our hearts. And we want to see families strengthened. We want to see families transformed. We want to see the restoration that God has to offer to every single person. We want to see that in your life as well. So welcome home once again. And uh, I want to share with you something really quick. I know that the kids are, are having a blast. There's jumpers. I heard them screaming. I'm like, yes, my kids are going to be tired tonight. It's going to be awesome. They're going to go to school early with a change of, you know, a change of hour and everything. But uh, check this out. I want to share with you something that we've been, up until today, we've been talking about the last seven words that Jesus shared from the cross. So Jesus is bleeding out. He's literally hanging on the cross. He's suffocating because he did not die of blood loss. He didn't die of pain. The historians say that he died because his diaphragm could no longer push him up because he was so exhausted that when people would die on the cross, they would die of suffocation. So Jesus, with his last breath, literally his last breath, he manages to say seven things to us. And these seven things are so important, it's been said that the words of Jesus at the cross are windows by which we can see the heart of God. These are windows that by which we can see the heart of God. Each of these words are oceans of truth compressed into a few drops of speech. Oceans of truth compressed into a few drops of speech. How many of you know that the last words of a person are very important words? The words of a dying man, the wishes of a dying woman, those last few words are so important. I've had the chance, the blessing, the opportunity to sit by people while they pass. I've heard people say, can you hear them sing? Can you hear them sing? I've heard people say, where are my family? Where is everybody? These last words are so important because they express the desire of our hearts. Now these are the last words of Jesus before going and defeating death on our behalf. The first word that we heard, which was three weeks ago, I want to give you a quick synopsis. And finally arrive today at the fourth word. But I want to catch you up in case you were not here. And more than just a, a, a summary, I want us to not forget what we've been learning, what God has been doing in our hearts. The first word that Jesus says to us, he actually, it seems like he's saying to some people there that are hurting him, but he says it to us as well. His first words that we hear are found, of course, in the Bible. And he says, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing the first word that Jesus shares with us is a word of forgiveness I was talking to some parents this week and we were talking about how hard it is to forgive those that hurt us how easy it is to speak of it but how hard it is to put it into practice C.S. Lewis says that forgiveness is a beautiful concept until it's our turn to forgive how many of us know that forgiveness is not an easy thing to to err is human to forgive is divine how many of you in this room can say, I am good at forgiving? I want to tell you this, that a good marriage is not because there's two amazing people together, but two amazing forgivers. 
that have learned to live together. I didn't say that. That was Billy Graham's wife, Ruth Graham. She says, a great marriage is simply comprised of two good forgivers. Again, how good are you at forgiving? And I would take it even further, how, you are good, how good are you at forgiving yourself? Because sometimes we carry shame, we carry guilt, we carry, we carry weight on our backs. And how many times have I heard people go to encounter and say, Pastor, I feel like I'm 100 pounds lighter. And I'm like, eh, maybe two pounds. <laughs> how many times have we said, man, I cannot, I cannot express this. I feel so much lighter. I feel like I can run. I feel like the world is different. I feel like I have no strength in my heart. Why? Because unforgiveness has been weighing them down. It's been said that unforgiveness or, or bitterness is like drinking poison, expecting somebody else to die. Do you carry unforgiveness in your heart? There's a reason why Jesus said, Father, forgive them. Now, he didn't say forgive them after the fact. He said forgive them while they were torturing him, literally killing him. While they were destroying him. He said, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. And you may ask yourself, oh, they do know what they're doing. You're telling me, Pastor, do you really believe that people don't know what they do? And I will tell you this, people don't know the extent of their words. In the last 20 years plus that I've been pastoring, I have been able to see how people have no clue how deeply they can hurt their own family. I know we sometimes when we're angry, we say things we shouldn't and we try to hurt people, but we don't realize how long that pain lasts. We have no clue how many generations it could even impact. You have no idea who the person is, so you hurt the person. We first devalue that which we hurt. If we valued it, we wouldn't destroy it. And so they had Jesus in front of them, and he, they, they destroyed him, they hurt him, they completely disfigured him. Why? Because they didn't know. They didn't know what they were doing. They didn't know who he was. They didn't know who they were doing it to. Sometimes we hurt our own people. We hurt our kids. We hurt our family. We hurt people that we love. Why? Because we don't know what God is doing in their lives. We don't know the precious blood of Jesus that was shed for them. They are worth one crucified Christ. We sometimes hurt people because we also don't know what we're doing. We also reject Jesus because we don't know exactly who he is. We know that he's a historical figure. We know that he walked on this earth. We know that there's more evidence for him than Abraham Lincoln walking on this earth. We know he was here. But do you know who he really is? Just like those soldiers had no idea that Jesus was Jesus the Christ, the Messiah, the one that was saving them. In the same way many times people today reject them because they heard a smart TikTok. They heard a good reel and it sounded good and so somebody managed to make fun of Christ now. They use him as a cuss word. And they think that Jesus is not who Jesus really is. And so we don't know what we're doing so we reject him, we reject his words. And he still from the cross says, Father forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. The second word is a word of forgiveness, a word that tells you and I, God loves you so much. Even when you don't know what you're doing, God says, I still love you. I have three boys and I love them so much. Ten, seven, and two. And the two gives us enough work for ten more kids. And this kid is awesome. Today he uh, played with the toilet water. He had chocolate all, all over his face. He, he, oh man, I can't even, today he was something else. He was being a, a what do they call him? Uh, two, what is it called? Terrific two. Yeah, thank you so much. Right? I was like, man, this kid is something else. But guess what? I still love him. Even if, he, if, if I have to change him, not change him, but change his diaper, I still love him. You know, God loves you so much. And you think he doesn't because of the things that you have done or the things that have been done to you or the things that you have gone through. And I want to tell you this, that God loves you this much. With arms nailed wide open, he loves you so much. And he says, Father, forgive them because they don't know what they're doing. A word of forgiveness. The first word. It's a powerful word. But then he goes on to say, and it's an, an incredible word too, because he's there and he shows us how that love plays out. You see Jesus hanging on the cross. And if you had a grandma like my grandma, you would have seen crucifix on the wall. And perhaps you would have seen Jesus with this little towel around his waist. And he's looking like this. But I want to tell you that this Jesus is a conquering king. That Jesus is not a defeated man. That Jesus wasn't just hanging there because he was a victim. Jesus is there not because someone put him there. Jesus is there by his own accord. Jesus went to the cross. He wasn't taken to the cross. Very big difference. See, I didn't come to this country. I came to this country. No, I was dragged to this country. I was brought to this country. Now I love this country. This is my nation. But that woman right there, she brought me. My mom's here, by the way. I love you so much, mom. Te quiero mucho, mamá. Eres una reina, te amo. 
Uh, but she brought me to this country. I didn't come. You see, the same thing. Jesus wasn't, Jesus wasn't taken to the cross. No, Jesus went to the cross on his own accord. And there at the cross, he says some amazing words, words that have baffled many theologians, words that many religious people, pe religious people simply hate. Many religious people can't stand these words because it messes up their religiosity. It messes up their, their, their idea of goodness and righteousness. Jesus is sitting, hanging there next to two thieves, a thief that was condemned to death just like the other one. Both unrighteous men, both according to their own testimony, by their own confession, public confession, we deserve what we are getting. And at that moment, at the gate of hell, Jesus gives them a second chance. Right before he enters hell, Jesus says, no, 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 today you're going to be with me in paradise. Today, that's the second word, today you'll be with me in paradise. Jesus didn't ask him what church you go to. He didn't ask him, did you tithe? He didn't ask him, well, did you read the Bible? Yeah, all of it? Let me see. Let me see your devotional. Jesus didn't say, did you subscribe to a, to t did you subscribe to a, what is it, Pure Flix? Pure Flix, is it? The Christian? <laughs> did, do, you, do you watch the Christian network? Do you, I don't know, do you, what, what, what good things did you do? He didn't ask any of that. I think when the man showed up upstairs, right, when the man entered into heaven, he had no idea what to do. He was brand new at this. He must have heard the angels singing, and he knew none of the, none of the songs. He was like, ah, ah, watermelon, watermelon. I'm just going to lift up my hands. I'm going to go along with it. You see, this guy was brand new to this. He simply stepped in. And, you know, you, you, you got to ask yourself, I mean, what did he do? He didn't do anything. He simply recognized who he was and who Jesus was. He simply received the gift of eternal life. You know, it is that simple. Some people don't think it's that simple, but it's exactly that simple. To be loved is simply that. God loves you, not because of what you've done, but because of who he is. He is love. He cannot deny his nature. He loves you. He loves you. Again, he loves you. He loves you so much. He loves you. He loves you. I don't know if you're like a pastor. He absolutely loves you. And not only does he love you, he knows you. I've met people that don't want to get close to others because they think that if they get close, they're going to get rejected. Like if, I, if they knew me, they, they wouldn't talk to me. If they knew me, they really knew who I was. Then how could they? Yet Jesus knows you intimately, deeply. He created you. He fashioned you. The word of God says that he literally weaved you in your mother's womb. He loves you. And he knows you. And he desires relationship with you. And this is what he tells this thief. Today you will be with me in paradise. The last man that Jesus saw on earth. The one, the last companion he had next to him was that thief. And the first one he walked into heaven with was that thief. This man did nothing but receive the love of God. A word of salvation for you and for me. Not of membership, not a word of religion, but simply saying, I love you so much. And this is why we're here. Honestly, I didn't study to be a pastor. I didn't want to be a pastor. To be very honest with you, my wife married me because she didn't, she married me because she knew I was a pastor's kid and she's like, oh, he's not going to want to be a pastor, so I'll marry him. She's a pastor's kid too. Let's not be pastors. But isn't that weird how that turned out? And today we love, love this ministry. We love what God is doing, but not because it's religion, but because we have been recipients of the love of Christ, because we know that we, just like that same thief, we had the choice to walk away. You know what? This is so cool. That day, all of human, all the answers that human can present to the love of God are found in these two thieves. Either yes, you are the king of kings, and I deserve what I have coming, but would you please accept me? Or there's the other attitude of the world, ah, if you really are. Show me a sign. Show me. I got to see it to believe it. Oh, really? Why don't you save yourself then save me? And if that doesn't work out, just cuss him out. Curse at him. The two attitudes of this world. My question is, how do you respond to the love of God? Show me. Oh, God, I know I don't deserve it. But thank you so much. Would you please? Let's give God a round of applause if you understand what I'm saying. I guess you could just summarize it like this. One died in sin. One died 
to sin, and one died for sin. One of the thieves died in sin. No hope. Get out of it through his own words, his intelligence. The other guy, he died to sin. He said, I'm done with that. I want something different. And the other one was dying for both of them and for you and for me. What a beautiful word. Today you will be with me in paradise. Once again, today you will be with me in paradise. We're not clothed in religion. We're clothed in righteousness. We're clothed in the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Third word that we find, and to me this was a word that's so beautiful, and it's, to me it's even more beautiful today. Like I told you, my mom is here. And this is Jesus caring for the family. This is Jesus, while he was saving you and I, he wasn't too busy for his mom. He wasn't too busy to care for his own. While he sees the pain of the world, he also sees the individual. This is Jesus, while he's saving us, all generations thereafter, he looks at his mother and he says, Mom, here's your son. And he looks at John, the beloved disciple, by his own accord, and he says, John, here's your mom. You know that? Jesus didn't procrastinate these words. Jesus knew he was going to die at the cross. Jesus didn't have, let me put it like this. I don't want to ask to raise hands, but how many of you guys have a, a will? Like, I don't mean like William in your family. I mean like when you pass away, you already know where things are going. You know who might take care of your children if you're not here to take care of them. How many of you actually have a proactive, I guess you could say, plan? Some of you perhaps already bought your, your, your space where, you will, where your, uh, your body will lay. I know it sounds morbid, this sermon all of a sudden turned, but what I'm trying to say is that Jesus wasn't, be, he didn't say it at the cross like, oh snap, I'm dying. <gasps> My mom. Like he didn't just forget. Jesus knew where he was going. He knew he was going to be crucified. He calculated, he said these words for you and I to understand something. He wasn't like, oh snap. No, he saw his mother. He took the time. And he said something so beautiful. He said it because he knows, and I know too, that there's redemption for our families. He knows that he died at the cross. Listen, he died at the cross, not just for your salvation, but he wants to take care of your family as well. The Bible says that, as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Joshua 14, 15. And for me and my house, 24, 15, we will serve the Lord. Now, here's the crazy thing. The Bible also says that with one of the house that believes, the entire house will be saved. Okay, this is wild to me because I've seen one Christian or one person that believes in God and the rest of the family make fun of them for it. And I'm thinking, really, God, is that how it works? Like, boom, he's saved. Now they have no choice. They're going to be saved. Ha-ha, <laughs> It's not how it works. What does that mean? It means that when one person believes and actually believes and you walk what you believe and you live out what you believe, others will see and will have no choice but not hear about it but see about it. You know? Today I pray that you came here today because someone loves you, because someone perhaps showed you the love of God. They're not perfect, but I think they believe. I want to ask you this. Is Christ in your home? Have you brought him home? Has Christ been a part of your family? I have good friends, friends that I, I play sports with, friends, friends that I, you know, golfing partners. I have friends that I, I do business with. I have friends that, that come to church, and I have many friends from school, from college. I have many, many friends, but can I tell you this? Those are good friends, but my family, man, I love my family. I care about my family. I would die for my family. Family is so important. Family. <laughs> I love my family. I know you love your family, but can I tell you this? God loves your family so much more than you do. God absolutely loves your family. He knows what you're going through. He knows what your marriage goes through. He knows what your children are facing, what they're encountering, and he tells you today, I have you covered. I have you covered. I care about you. I see you. Just as he saw Mary, he sees your family. I have seen God restore families. I've seen God do amazing things. And I love that because it's true today and it can be true in your life as well. The first thing, though, that you have to understand is that God loves you, yes, but he also wants to restore your family. Let me wrap it up like a good tamalito, all right? First thing is this, the true gospel, the good news of salvation, they don't only redeem you. You know what redemption is? When you buy something back, maybe it was yours, you lost it, and you bought it back to yourself. God redeemed you. He paid such a high price for your life. He bought you back. The Bible says that you were taken as a ransom. He paid for you. You have to understand that, that the enemy took you from his hands through sin. You were taken. 
And you thought that he abandoned you, but sin took your heart. So Jesus paid the ultimate price. He gave us a ransom, his life for you. He redeemed you. The moment you receive Christ in your heart, you have been redeemed. Now you are no longer facing death. You're facing life in God. But that doesn't mean you have been restored. That doesn't mean you have been renewed. So a lot of people have been redeemed, and they're looking at God, but they still feel like hell. They're going to heaven, but their lives still look like hell. Why? Why is there living hells at home? Why is it that some people are still empty? Because there hasn't been a renewal inside their hearts. So first you are redeemed, but then you need to be renewed. That process is called sanctification. It comes through mortification so you can have vivification. Do you understand? <laughs> you and I have to first be renewed. The Bible says in Romans chapter 12, verse 1 and 2, it says, And I beg you, brothers, by the mercies of God, that you would be renewed in your understanding, that you would renew your mind. This is the only way that you're going to be able to find God's good and perfect will for your lives. But without renewal, you have no restoration, which is the end result. A lot of people think that, boom, I give my life to Christ. I go to church. Watch me. I'm restored. No, buddy. You have been redeemed. Now it's time to be renewed. It's called discipleship. Now let's go ahead and receive the restoration. You can't just say, God forgave me. You have to forgive me. No, God forgave me. Let me walk in love. Let me walk in forgiveness. Let me walk in patience so you can see what forgiveness looks like. But a lot of the times people expect religion and church to save them. No, it's Christ who saves. And if Christ saved you, he saved you for himself, not just so you could be away from things. He saved you for a purpose. You see, the beautiful thing about God, one of the most amazing things about him is that he's not just stopping you from things. What a boring thing that would be. Sanctification without purpose is the most boring of religions. But when God has been set you apart for something incredible, something greater, for an amazing purpose, even the wounds, even the scars of your life have a purpose. Did you know this? That God has a plan for you and for your life. And here's the beautiful thing about this. He doesn't save you from, he saves you for. He saves you for amazing things. Give God a round of applause if you understand what I'm saying. And the last thing about this word, which I love, is just who says it is the beloved disciple. John, the beloved disciple. Okay, John wrote those words. John speaks on third person, and he says, I am the beloved disciple. Today, we have uh, my sister here as well. Marisol, are you here? Mari, Mari? My sister here? Hi, Mari, how are you? It's my sister, my older sister. I love her. She's incredible. Um, I'm, the, I'm the favorite of the family, by the way. I am. Now, she thinks she is, but I think I am. Mari, tell them the truth. Who is the favorite child of our mom? <laughs> she says, you think you are. Here's the crazy thing. We really each believe that we are our mom's favorite. Like that lady did a, a pretty good job at that. Like she makes her believe and I believe. And if I wrote a book, I would write in the book, I am Pablo, the beloved son of Gina Molina. <laughs> and if she wrote the book, it would say, Mari Sol, the beloved child of Gina Molina. Let me tell you why. Because we know how loved we are. John knows how loved he is. He's the only one of the 12 that writes these words. The only one. Of course, we know Judas is not going to write those words. He did. But the other guys had a chance. Peter had a chance. Man, Peter was forgiven after betraying Jesus. And he calls himself what Jesus called him, Peter. He used to be Simon. Now he's the rock. But he doesn't call himself the beloved Peter. Isn't that cool that John refers to himself as a beloved disciple? And we figured out why. Because John also betrayed Jesus. What? Yes, he also denied Jesus. What do you mean? Everyone walked away from God. While he was being arrested, all the homies ran away. While he was being arrested, nobody came to testify. While he was being tried, everyone turned their backs on Jesus. Everyone means everyone. Everyone means John as well. But only John came back to the foot of the cross. It was only John that you could find at the foot of the cross, and it is at the foot of the cross where you and I can truly know how loved we are. And that is what leads us to this last word. And in the last 11 minutes, I hope that you can grasp the love that God has for you. This fourth word is so precious, it's so valuable, it's so beautiful. And if you look at it on the surface, you may not grab it, but I pray that you go deeper and that you don't allow anything to steal this from you. This is where Jesus is there at the cross, 
He's about to die. He's bleeding out like I told you. His body has been torn. His back without skin is sticking to the wooden plank. Christ has been nailed to the cross. His face has been deformed. His beard has been ripped off. His head has been stabbed by these two-inch thorns. Jesus has been whipped. Jesus now is about to die. He can barely breathe. And he says, Abba, Abba, lava sabachthani. Which means father, father. No, 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 no. Which means my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, lava sabachthani. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Jesus is now hanging there. And the first time you ever heard Jesus say, God, instead of Father. As Jesus walked on this earth, he knew who he was. He was not just Jesus. He was the son of the living God. As a matter of fact, he was crucified. He was beaten. He was arrested. He was taken. Why? Because he knew he was the son of God. See, Jesus all the time referred to God as the Father. The first time and the only time you find in the Gospels, Jesus speaking to God as God is here. And to you, it may be like, well, he is God, yes. But to Jesus, he's not just God. It's his Father. There's a difference now, though, that this moment, God had turned his back on his Son. And you say, God, how could you turn your back on your Son? Why would you ever do that? Why would you ever turn your back on the most loving, most incredible being ever to walk this earth? If you really are a good God, if you really are a good Father, you promise that you would never leave us or abandon us. That's for you and for me. But he had to walk away from Jesus Christ. Let me put some context real quick. For a Jewish boy, for a Jewish man, the worst thing that could ever happen to him is that his father would turn his back on him. It's to be disowned as a son. The worst thing you can do in this culture is to say you are no longer a part of this family. I know nowadays there's a lot of dishonor to parents. Young people seem to not understand the value of a mother or of a father and the love and respect. It's almost like, I'll respect you if you respect me. What? That's not respect. That's some currency that you have figured out in the social construct. Respect towards them is simply because them are them. They are your mother and father. The Bible says, love your mother and your father. If they cook well, if they pay the rent, if they do things for you, if they, if they buy you an iPad, if they pay your phone, no, it says honor your mother and your father. You see, honor in this culture particularly was so important, and Jesus now is standing there in front of all these people, and he says, Father, no, he says, God, why did you abandon me? I wish I had more time to explain to you why Psalms 22 is so important to this, because Jesus is quoting Psalms 22. Psalm 22 is a psalm that was written almost a thousand years before the crucifixion. It explains literally the cross. It talks about him being pierced. It talks about how these soldiers were casting lots for his own garments. It's such a prophetic psalm. And I wish I had more time for that, but you're going to have to dig into that one. Instead, let me spend the last couple minutes just explaining why is it that Jesus was abandoned. More than why, let me tell you for who. It is for you and for me. It is because he loves you and because he loves me so much. I want to show you a couple pictures. I cannot find a better description. I have this dialogue with, uh, with, uh, with one of my best friends. She happens to be my sister-in-law. And I used, used to use her as an example, but I don't want to use her as an example because the story itself, I guess I'll explain it. Okay, I used to say this story, and I'm going to tell you this story. And it didn't actually happen, but pretend that it happened with me, okay? Go back to this day, my wedding day. Let me show you a picture real quick. Okay. Sorry, I'm going to tie my shoe. Meanwhile, we go to my wedding day. You got it? Wedding day, you have it? I didn't send them to you? <laughs> oh, then you're not gonna have them. Can I send them to you? Is technology good enough today? Let's see what do we do. Mm. Are you guys okay with that? You guys okay? Yeah. Give me a minute to send them, or should we just skip it? No. Maybe this is the Lord telling me not to do it. All right, I'll just send you the pictures. Where do you want me? Oh, Liz, check the production team, uh, production team email. By the way, Liz is single. She's amazing. She loves the Lord. She loves Jesus. She's gorgeous any guys that are smart <laughs> just kidding <laughs> but i'm not kidding i mean really guys come on better better than uh i think is the best place to find your spouse just saying look around <laughs> just kidding. okay guys so so i'll just begin to tell you the story let me know if it's there liz you got it 
Yeah, um, this is fun. Okay, cool deal. Hold on one second. <laughs> you guys put music? I love it. Good job, production team. Awesome, awesome. We should like bring up a testimony or something. All right, all right, cool, cool. So, um, yeah, I could text it to you. One second, the book of You're like, man, what kind of church did you bring me to? We need to get the act together. All right, hold on a second. I'm just going to take you the actual pictures. Is that cool? Okay, all right, cool deal, cool deal. Here goes a few. Go ahead and put those on. Ah, there's a good one. See? Sorry, I'm updating my Instagram. I'm just kidding. All right, cool, cool, cool. So, so go back with me to that wedding day. So we... We got married in this place called the, the Arboretum. Have you guys heard? If you want a cheap date, like a good date without spending too much money, invite her to the Arboretum. It's this place in Arcadia across the street from the mall, so I know you're, don't go to the mall. Scary, expensive. You go to the other place, beautiful garden, like it's amazing. Full of like all kinds of beautiful flowers. There's like water running, it's just gorgeous. Full of peacocks, like, like really nice, it's just incredible. So Emily and I, we had this dream to get married outdoors. And we finally, God provided in such an incredible way. We got this place in this rose garden. And it was like everything was blossomed. It was beautiful, white place. I know I talk about it like this. Liz, do you have that? Yeah? Hi. <laughs> All right, let's just move forward then. If you find it, you let me know. Okay, so, so we got married in this, in this rose garden. And I remember... Um, my mom even sent these mariachis from Arizona, mariachis from Arizona, like if there wasn't mariachis in Los Angeles, you know? <laughs> but she found some mariachis in Arizona, and she had this, this, this ta -da -da -da, you know, like mariachi style. It was tight pants and everything. It was so exciting, so cool. And, I, and you know, that day, I was, I was just super pumped because it's my wedding day. I want you to go with me to that place. Roses all around, family, everybody's happy. Uh, you got this stud-looking Mexican right in front of you. Mm, Good-looking brother, right? He's just standing right there, ready to get married. And all of a sudden, like, you know, the music starts playing, and this gorgeous blonde girl walks through the back with her dad, like, I am arrested immediately. <laughs> so, so she's back there, and, and she, starts, she starts walking up. But I want you to imagine this. Before, before she can make her way to the altar, let's just say one of her sisters this didn't happen, but let's just say she trips while she's going to go hug her. And because there are peacocks in Arcadia, she drops and falls on top of not a peacock, but what the peacock had dropped earlier all over her. And she gets up and she's like, oh, but she doesn't care because her sister's big day is coming. Eoni! And imagine she goes to hug her. What do you think Eoni, my gorgeous bride, would do? What would you do? Heisman Trophy winner, like, no, wouldn't you, or would you be like, it's okay, I love you anyway, sis, what would you do, you love her to death, like, this is a moment you want to share with her, but she, you, are pure, that day is a gorgeous day, it's a perfect day, you are pure, you're literally clean, and so, because you love her, you don't want to reject her, but you must keep her at an arm's length. Because you don't love her? No, but because of her condition. Because of her stains. Uh, there's the mariachi. Oh, okay, okay. Cool. There's Frank. I'm just kidding. <laughs> ah, how did that get in there? Oh, I don't know. All right, next one, next one. Sorry for the low resolution. Ah, that's the two? No more? Another kiss, maybe? <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Okay, can you show the picture of the sisters, maybe? Or of her in the white dress? That is the white dress? Can we take that one down? It's kind of weird. <laughs> hey, okay, that's a, okay, cool, cool. So that's uh <laughs> Let's just say that one's that. Ah, perfect. But let's just imagine what would happen. Same thing. This is literally what happened. I mean, this to me is the best example until I find a better one. Help me out if you find a better one. But God loves you so much, and he wants you near him. And this is Jesus saying, why have you abandoned me? Let's go to another picture of Eoni just with her white dress. Why have you abandoned me? Why? It's not why. It's for who? 
For who? It's because your sin and my sin keep us away from God. God loves you so much, and he hates anything that keeps you away from him. You know the definition, the best definition of the cross that I've ever come across is this. God's hatred against sin poured on his own son instead of you. God hates sin, yet he loves you. So he had to come up with a solution. And that is that his son would pay for your debt and for mine. Jesus was rejected so that you and I can be accepted. Jesus was rejected so you and I can be accepted. Jesus Christ became the sacrifice that you and I should have given, that you and I should have paid. Why don't you stand up with me for a second, just for a second. The Bible is very clear, and I love how clear it is because it kind of breaks down my excuses, you know? Separation from God is the definition of hell. My son asked me, Dad, how do you think heaven is going to be? And I answer the best way I can according to the scripture. But then I also have to explain to him that it's not just heaven, there's also another place. A place that we don't like to talk about, a place that no pastor likes to preach anymore. A place that's used as a cause word, but it's not used in the church anymore. But I have to tell you something. If you don't know what God saved you from, how could you be grateful? If you don't know what he's done for you, if you have no idea what he had to pay, how could you be grateful? So a lot of people are very ungrateful. If anything, they pretend like he's a third option, the fourth string player, when in reality, he's the star of the game. He is the protagonist of our lives. Christ died for you. He had to die for you because there was no one else that could pay for your sin and for mine. Everyone else is in debt. Everyone is in debt. The Bible says that there's not one righteous, only one, and his name is Jesus Christ. Only he could have paid the price that you and I owed. So there at the cross, he says these words, words that he, I believe, crushed him, words that I think were the worst things that he could have ever had to say. Let me explain it like this. Christ had been laying, he had been hanging on the cross for six hours by this hour. Six hours he had been tortured. He had been beaten. He had been abused. He had been torn to pieces. And he didn't say one single word. Do you know that he endured all kinds of pain? And the Bible says that as a sheep is led to the slaughter. That's how Christ walked. He didn't say anything. He didn't complain. He didn't whine. He didn't cry. And in this moment, he says, no, he cries out, God, God, why have you forsaken me? Why is it that he chooses this moment to cry out when he didn't cry out for all the physical pain? Because it's the pain that you don't see, the scars that we cannot see that are harder to heal, aren't they? It's that rejection. It's that pain that we feel inside. And I have to tell you this today. Today you will have to make a choice either to accept or reject God, but you cannot stand in the middle. You cannot be neutral. Just as that day in my wedding day, Pastor Herman Galvez, he asked us, do you today take this bride as your beloved wife? And if I would have kept silence, if I didn't say anything, Imagine what would have happened. You tell me, would I be here today? She would have killed me. <laughs> no, would I be here today? Would she be here today? Would Pastor Jorge, Pastor Laura, would my sons be here today if I would have kept silence? See, because we think that if we're just quiet, we're just in neutral ground. But neutrality is a rejection of it. Now, if you feel pushed by this pastor, so be it. You push people to do way worse things, if you know what I'm saying. Oh, bro, you're going to take that, bro? Oh, bro, come on. You're going to let her talk like that about you? And yet I'm here trying to tell you that God loves you so much. Don't reject his love. And somehow, somewhere we feel pushed. Praise God for those kind of pushes. What if I said to you today that today you will make a choice. When you walk out of this place, either to love God and accept his grace or to reject it. 
You cannot deny he was a person that walked this earth. No sane person could ever do that. Even atheists accept the historicity of Christ. The question is not that he walked this earth. The question is, was he a liar, a lunatic, or is he the Lord? Did he do those things that he did, and did he walk on this earth the way that he said he walked, and the way that hundreds of people have said, the way that thousands of people like myself have been transformed by his life? We have seen his power. We have seen his grace. The question is, who is he to you? And the question again goes, why have you forsaken me? And the answer is simple. The word gives us the word, the word gives us the answer for your sin and for my sin. I want you to close your eyes with me for a second. I want to do two things with your eyes closed. Man, I love, absolutely love God. I love him so much. I cannot tell you that, man, I wish, I really do wish with all of my heart right now that I had better words, that I was more eloquent to be able to explain to you how much he loves you. All I can tell you is this, he was rejected he had to have separation from the most incredible, intimate relationship this world will ever know. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The unity between the Father and the Son was from before the foundation of the earth. And yet for you and for me, that bond was separated. He had to take on your sin and my sin, and that sin caused a rejection from the Father until he died and defeated death then the glory day came and this is why you and i today have to say god thank you for dying for my sins for paying the price that i could never pay so today i want to pray for two kinds of people the first kind of people are the people that have not given their life to christ i remember being in that moment in my own life where i had all kinds of questions but the one thing i knew was this that i needed jesus in my life if this is you today and if you recognize that you want God, that you want Him in your life, that you want to walk with Him, you don't know how, but you're going to walk with Him. You don't know how, but God is providing a way right now. He has caused this moment to happen. Some of you should not be alive today. You shouldn't even be here today. Yet God brought you to His house to tell you that He loves you. He used human strings. He used many ways to get you to His presence. And today you're standing right before the Lord and He tells you, I love you so much. Would you receive my gift? of eternal life if this is you and you want to give your life to Christ in a time where everybody posts everything and everybody even the pictures of their food this is a time where you can say literally to God I receive you I don't care who says what I want you more than anything else I want you God if you want to give your life to Christ I want to ask you to come to the front and I want to pray with you perhaps a person that invited you can come with you but I want to pray with you I want to make sure that today you make the decision for him and not against him. Come out to the front. We love you so much. Come on out. Is there someone here that wants to give their life to Christ? God bless you, bro. God bless you. You're awesome. God bless you, man. You're awesome, too. You guys are amazing. Come on up. Come on up. Come on over here. God bless you guys. God bless you so much. Man, I love it. You guys are amazing. You guys are incredible. As you guys come up to the front, man, God bless you guys. God bless you so much. You guys are beautiful. You're making the best decision you could ever make. The best decision you could ever make. God bless you guys. Come on up to the front. God bless you guys. If you can move a little closer because the aisles are getting full. God bless you guys so much. God bless you guys. Man, God bless you. Church. People are giving their life to Christ right now. Just like you did, just like I did. God bless you guys so much. Come on up. Come on up. Come on up. God bless you guys, man. God bless you. God bless you. Can I tell you something? One day that lady over there, my mom, she gave her life to Christ. I didn't know her yet. I was still too little. <laughs> Before I was born, she decided to follow Jesus. And that impacted forever the way things would be in her life she was never the same and now my sister my brother and I we love God with all of our hearts we serve him our families have a beautiful future because of that one decision that she made that day don't underestimate the power of the decision that you're making today one day Pastor Jorge and Pastor Laura they decided to follow Jesus they decided to serve God with all of their hearts and my wife Doris 
Nadia, Meli, their spouse, their husbands, now they all serve God with all of their hearts. Our children will serve the Lord too. We have to tell you something. Don't underestimate the power of the decision that you're making right now. God loves you so much, and I'm so glad you're choosing Him over so many other things. God bless you so much. God bless you guys. Close your eyes with me, and let's pray this prayer together. This is not the end. This is the beginning of this journey with God. With your eyes closed, I want to lead you in prayer. But more importantly, this has to be yours. It's not special, magical words. It is faith that saves you. Faith in Christ. Not in me, not in the church. It's just in the living God. He died for you. He paid for your sins. And today, He's giving you that beautiful, beautiful chance to walk with Him. Would you tell Him, Jesus Christ, come on. Jesus Christ, I ask you today to forgive me and to change me. Forgive me for all my sins. Thank you for dying in the cross to pay the price that I could never pay. I want to walk with you for the rest of my life. Will you make me the person that you want me to be? Tell him, Jesus, Jesus, thank you for not only dying, but also resurrecting to give me eternal life. Jesus Christ, I receive your gift of salvation today. In your name I pray. Amen and amen. Give God one more round of applause. Look at me for one more second. I want you to do something else because I understand in, in living out the gospel, it's not easy, guys. It is not easy. People are going to tell you, nah, man, you can't change. Oh, now you all of a sudden got, right? They're going to try to tell you, even your own past will try to tell you, you are who you are. You're going to be able to tell your past. You're going to be able to tell those people, I'm sorry. I don't know who you're talking about. Because I was born again on Sunday night. You are a new creation. God made you a new creation. But now it's about taking the next step. What do you do now? The offer letter has been extended, but what do you do? I want you to do something. It'll take four minutes, literally three minutes. I'm going to pray for all these sinners behind you. <laughs> but meanwhile, I want you to do something. Emily and Ma Manny and Emily, would you guys come over? Manny is uh, one of my best friends. He's been walking with me for a long time, and I actually officiated their wedding. And they're amazing people. Emily is incredible. And they want to tell you what the next step is. If you don't have a Bible, they'll give you a Bible. If you need money, they'll let you borrow my now. No, but they will explain to you what the next step is in following Christ. Take the next few minutes. Would you guys follow Manny and Emily to this room? We're not going anywhere. We're going to pray for them. And then, uh, is that okay? Yeah? Can you guys walk with Manny and Emily? Yeah? Thank you guys so much. You guys are amazing. You guys are incredible. Don't worry about anything. I'm going to pray for the rest of the people real quick. Thank you, Manny. Thank you, Emily. Thank you guys so much. You guys are amazing. Give them a round of applause. Come on, one more round of applause, church. What an amazing day. What a glorious day to give your life to Christ, to give your life to Jesus Christ. Right where you are, I want you guys to close your eyes. One more second, I want to pray for you. I want to pray for the people that are here today. And maybe today you... Everybody, please close your eyes. Don't open your eyes. Don't pray for other people. This is just you and God. Maybe you didn't come up to the front. Maybe you were too embarrassed, too scared, or maybe you just... You didn't believe in you. You didn't believe that what you were going to do was going to last. Well, let me pray for you too. Or maybe you had gone to Christ. You have come to church. Maybe you are even a part of a ministry already. Or you were raised in church and you walked away. But today, I want to pray a simple prayer of reconciliation. A prayer where guilt is removed. Where God gives you new faith, new strength. As I was preparing for this message, man, there's so much more. There's something so beautiful in Psalms 22 where he says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Eli, Eli, And I read the rest of the chapter. And I want to tell you right there with your eyes closed. This is not Jesus being a victim. This is Jesus reminding the people who also knew the Psalms 22. Reminding all the Jewish brothers and sisters in front of them that this was prophesied, this was meant to be, but also that the story doesn't end in a sad note. This story in Psalms 22, the chapter ends with the King of Kings, the Lord of Lords, being exalted above all else. Psalms 22 doesn't end in defeat, it doesn't end in the death of Jesus. Psalms 22 says, the afflicted will eat and be satisfied. Those who seek Him will praise the Lord. Let your heart live forever. All the ends of the earth will remember and turn to the Lord and all the families of the nations will worship before you. 
for the kingdom is the Lord's and the, he rules over the nations dear God I pray right now for anyone who might have been struggling that they will remember that you're a victorious king that you're a Lord who gives them victory that you're God who could get them out of any trouble that you're the God who can provide healing you're the God who, can, who has a good tomorrow for them God I pray right now that if somebody here has been losing hope that today God you give their their heart a new jolt of hope God that today they will know that you are victorious that yes you died on the cross but you also conquered death God I thank you for Good Friday I thank you because that day you died on the cross but I thank you even more because there was a Sunday because that resurrection Sunday also happened because you defeated death I thank you so much God because today people who are here and had walked away from you today they walk back to you and they tell you God I need new strength Thank you, God, because you're giving a new breath, a new wind, God. You're giving people a fresh wind in their hearts, in their lives. Dear God, I pray right now for anyone who has felt this courage. Give them new courage. Give them strength. Dear God, thank you because if anyone here has felt rejected, maybe they've been walking with you, God, and they felt the power of rejection over them, I pray, God, right now that they will feel your acceptance, that they will know, Father, that even if everyone rejects them, you accept them. You love them so much. God, thank you for this wonderful church. Thank you for this wonderful time, God. We exalt your name on high. We lift your name, God. Would you close your eyes again? Lift up your hands, and let's finish worshiping God. Amen.